We're running around a little bit trying to get our internet working properly. Uh, but I am the Director of Development and Marketing here at CPF. My name is Chris French, and right next to me is... John, you're muted. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, what's my title? <laughs> oh, oh, Field Services Director. Oh, you well, got that I one right. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to introduce um, uh, our special guest host who's joining us today. Uh, it's Gretchen Boyce, and she is Cultural Resource Consultant at ICF. Hello, Gretchen. Hello. Thank you for helping us out today. Gretchen's going to be running the Q&A. And I want to welcome again everybody to this special presentation. Uh, a few things. Uh, John, do you want to go over the basics? Sure, yeah. So today we have time for questions. Please ask them early and often and use the Q&A box. We prefer the Q&A box because that allows us to sort of moderate those questions. And I'm sure Gretchen would appreciate that. Um, in the Q&A box is an option to raise your, uh, I'm sorry, to thumbs up or vote for a question. So you can upvote questions that you like and that you wanna see answered. You can also raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, that means that we may activate your voice and video if you'd like to ask a question for our speaker today. Um, we're recording this on Facebook and also we will be posting to YouTube tomorrow. And uh, with that being said, we're gonna jump right into the program. Yeah, so I wanted to also mention, uh, why don't, if you're in our room, why don't you go ahead and post in the chat uh, where you're calling in from. I am here in my uh, A-frame in Orlando, Florida. And uh, what uh, we do encourage everyone to chat during the entire program. So if you think, if you find that that chat window is disturbing your experience, you can pull it to the side or minimize it because we do like to post quite a few links as our speakers are talking. And we've even had some people find their friends in the chat room. So if you'd like to go ahead and post that, we can, oh, I see Honolulu in there. Um, I'd love to introduce, uh, or it's my honor actually, to introduce our speaker, Kristen Shumler. Take it away, Kristen. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Shumler. I am a historian, archaeologist, and architectural historian. Uh, recently started working for Mead and Hunt. Um, and I am so happy to talk to you today about my research around prints. I do want to acknowledge a few things. First, I want to thank um, the California Preservation Foundation to ask, you know, ask me to do this presentation. But I also am presenting from Minneapolis, and I just need to sort of acknowledge that I am here is a privileged white woman talking about an African-American male in a city where we've seen so many tragedies. And I just want to sort of acknowledge that and, and be very clear about what I'm trying to do here. I am not trying to speak for um, the African-American experience in Minneapolis. I am a historian and I have gathered a context which I think gives some perspective on Prince's experience and um, Yes, I'm in sepia because I'm a historian. Um, I have too much light shining on me here. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge that what I'm trying to do here is to get those of us in the industry to really question why do we make things historic and how do we do it? We are the people who have the tools, the, the resources, the ability, and there are things that um, I think could be changed in our system to have more diversity and inclusion. And that's sort of uh, part of what I will also be talking about tonight. And um, yes, I do know that I am in sepia. I uh, I was saying my, um, I have too much light coming in on my windows and it was really washing me out. So, um, so anyway, thank you again for having me here. Um, so when the 80s were first dawning, it was January of 1980 when Prince and his band appeared on the Dick Clark show. And Dick Clark came out and marveled after Prince's and his band's performance and made this comment. This, you learned to do this in Minneapolis? He asked Prince, to which Prince responded, where? And Clark agreed saying, this is not the kind of music that comes from Minneapolis, Minnesota. To which Prince shakes his head and says, no, raises his eyebrows and laughs. Now maybe he was laughing because of course, he knows that this was the music that came from Minneapolis. But if, fast forward a few years later, when David Bowie was challenging MTV about why they didn't play videos by more black artists, to which Mark Goodman said, we don't just play to the people in New York and Los Angeles, but also those in Poughkeepsie or the Midwest, pick some town in the Midwest that would be scared to death of, by Prince, which were playing in a string of other black faces. 
we have to play the type of music the entire country would like. And I myself, when I was growing up in the pretty homogenous uh, town of Bismarck, North Dakota, when Prince first came on in 83, when they did start playing his videos, I didn't believe that he could be from, you know, just eight hours down the road from me. But I, and I think part of this came about because Prince himself obfuscated his background. I mean, he's saying, am I black or white? Am I straight or gay? He, he would often, um, change his story depending on which uh, journalist he was talking to. And he didn't do this out of shame of his background, but rather as a uh, Prince scholar Twyla Perry says, he was trying to not get stuck into the position that so many uh, black artists were at the time, you know, regulated to a certain type of music. Prince was strategic, ambitious, and clever, and he knew that if he wanted to have crossover success, he had to break through some of those racial barriers. And he himself said that so much has been written about me and people don't know what's right or wrong, I'd rather let them stay confused. So what I'm showing you today is a little bit of the research I've done. If you're a real Prince fan, I can't get into everything today, but if you check the website Preserve Minneapolis, I will be doing this tour this summer and it'll be about twice as long so we can get into some of the other properties. But today again, speaking to a preservation community, I just really wanna highlight some of the research and again, challenge some of our notions about what makes something historic. Hey, Kristen. So, Kristen yeah, this, this, uh, we can see your notes. <laughs> oh, thank you. You have to you. switch over. Okay. Um, it's hidden behind here. Display settings. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. It's always something. Um, so what is the Minneapolis sound and, and, and what is Prince's involvement? So again, there is no other place that Prince and the sound could have come from. The Minneapolis sound is considered a blending of rhythm and blues, jazz, funk, new wave, punk and rock and roll. Um, Prince and a lot of other artists growing up in the Twin Cities did not have access to full-time uh, black radio stations. So they would often be listening to short snippets from, from black radio programs, but then also listening to a lot of white music um, like Sant uh, well, other rock music, Santana, Led Zeppelin, all this blended together to create a very unique sound that comes out of you know, the Minneapolis music scene. Um, so I think if you asked, you know, just a person off the street, what they think of when they think of Prince of Minneapolis is two places, you know, really come to mind. First is First Avenue. So if you've seen the movie Purple Rain, which you, if you haven't, I highly encourage it. It's a very good rock and roll movie. Um, but in that movie, Prince becomes a star by making it at the club First Avenue. So he makes First Avenue famous. It's now considered one of the best music venues in the country. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, the outside of the building has stars with the name of performers who didn't piss off the manager and who also sold out the main room. So Prince has a star right next to the entrance that has been painted gold since the time of his passing. So this is a place I think people automatically think of when they think of Prince in Minneapolis or Minnesota. The other place in people's hearts would be Paisley Park. And this is um, Prince's artist compound that he actually built on the outskirts of the Twin Cities in a suburb called Chanhassen. He built it in 1987 and it really became his primary studio um, and part-time residence since then. Now, at the time of Prince's you know, unexpected passing, which we're almost up to the five-year anniversary of it will be next week on April 21st. People flock to both these places to pay tribute to the artist and the man. Um, my interest came in researching Prince Places because um, a, a newspaper article that ran after his passing noted that a childhood home of his was within a project area that I was studying for a transit project. So what started out as, you know, me sort of looking at that one property to determine if it had any significance um, led to four years and trying to uncover multiple properties associated with Prince um, on his historic journey from Minneapolis's north side to Paisley Park. Um, after you know Prince's passing, his status as a mu musical legend was really you know, honored through a lot of publications. Um, 
you know, this is a man who sold over 100 million records, 39 studio albums, several movies. Um, four of his records from the 1980s were considered, you know, the most important by uh, Rolling Stones with Purple Rain coming in second, only behind the clash is London Calling. He was a great collaborator. He won an Oscar, numerous Grammy awards. Um, he captured the ire of Tipper Gore and the Parent Music Resource Center through his lyrics for the song, Darling Nikki, which results in the parental warning labels that we now see. Um, he took on the music industry and really challenged the contracting procedures that they had. This is when he changed his name to the love symbol, saying that his contract under the name Prince wasn't valid because that wasn't his real name. And a lot of people thought, what is, what is he up to? But he was really challenging the concepts of how especially African-American artists aren't alone, you know, don't own their masters. And he, he really fought a prolonged battle to, to make that change. But Prince is, you know, really a musical legend because he really changed um, so many things, not just the sonic landscape, but also notions of what it means to be male or female, black and white, erotic and spiritual. He, he really captured the zeitgeist um, of the time and, and is, you know, I think correctly classified as um, a musical legend. But again, thinking about places associated with Prince and, and preservation of these places, you know, we have First Avenue, we have Paisley Park, but Prince spent almost his entire life in Minnesota. I'm actually thrilled to be talking to you all in California because California is probably the next state where there are many properties associated with Prince, because up until the time of building of Paisley Park, he did a lot of his recording in California. So anyone wants to partner with me to sort of work on that, just give me a call. But but Minnesota, he stayed here, he loved it. Um, this was, you know, his home for uh, decades. So there was a high likelihood that there would be a lot of different properties associated with him. So again, that is what my work has focused on. Um, but in order to give a little more context about the man who came to be known as the innovator of the Minneapolis Sound, I want to give a little background as to his family and Minneapolis's um, context, especially with African-American residents. Um, many of you have probably heard of the Great Migration. This is the time after the end of slavery. Um, you know, the, after the end of slavery, things didn't change much for the African-American people in the South. They were still, um, they were under Jim Crow laws and, um, you know, sharecropping systems, and there wasn't, you know, true freedom in, in the ways that they had anticipated. Now, come the turn of the century, um, there were needs for um, employees working in different industries, especially in the Rust Belt and other areas. So we see this mass migration of over 6 million people moving from the, the South into um, into these northern cities. There's two waves here. The, the, the first great migration happens from 1910 to 1940. And you can see that the, um, the, um, the purple is sort of where people are leaving and the orange is where they're going to. So this was a much smaller wave. And then the second great migration, 1940 to 1970. Now in Minnesota, only about 0.3% of our population was black in 1910. By 1930, which is the time Prince's uh, three, three grandparents uh, move up here, it rose to 0.4%. And then between 1950 and 1970, that's when we see the greatest influx of African-Americans um, coming up from the South. But even with this sort of huge gain during that time period, overall, African-Americans make up only about 1% of Minnesota's overall population in 1970. So it's still very, small um, community. Now, a lot of people left the South with visions of, you know, opportunity and having a better life for their family, only to move up North and other places to, to face a different form of segregation. Here in the Twin Cities, and I know across a lot of places across the nation, there were two really, um, I, I use the term effective, but, um, insidious tools for sort of um, creating this new type of segregation. And that was um, the use of having housing covenants. I put this one up here that describes a property that can only be occupied by a 
white person and that others cannot occupy the premise unless they're servants. And it's blended in with comments about garbage, refuse, and junk. This is actually the covenant on my house, built in 1940. Um, if you aren't aware of it, I know that there are several cities that are doing this, but here in Minnesota, there is this website, Mapping Prejudice, that shows you as, as the number of African-Americans moving from the South, are, that, that number is increasing as far as settling here in Minnesota, you see a correlating increase in these housing covenants. On top of that, um, well, so what we see is this, you know, sort of segregation of where African Americans can live. Um, we have a very dominant neighborhood in what's called the Seven Corners area, which is now pretty much eliminated by freeways in the University of Minnesota. But if you ever saw Prince's movie Graffiti Bridge, he set that here because it was a very vibrant uh, Black community, especially with uh, musicians. Um, bars and places like that for musicians to play. We have the, the South Side, which is where Prince's uh, paternal grandmother um, and his dad settled. And then we've got the North Side, which is where his maternal uh, grandparents settled. I also just want to note that the, the Purple Rain House, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today, that was cited right down here. And his song Uptown, this is located in this part of the city, white, black, Puerto Rican, everybody just a freak. And obviously, um, Prince knew the geography of the city well and really tied in a lot of his work to the city that, that he grew up in. So not only do we have the housing covenants limiting where people can live, then on top of the, as many of you know, there was redlining. So in those areas where um, African Americans were concentrated, the Seven Corners area, the um, south side and north side, it was almost impossible for people to get loans to purchase their house, so they could not develop intergenerational wealth to pass on to their, their children. Um, there's, um, and, and this practice continued for, for many decades and really shaped, you know, the, the cities. And even when you look at it today, with um, the percentage of Black uh, people who are stopped for low-level arrests, you can see how it correlates whoops, with that um, pattern of where people live, which was established during this time of the Great Migration. Now, Prince, like I said, knew this. Um, he was quoted as saying that he was as much a part of the city where he grew up as anything, and that he saw both sides of the racial issue, the oppression and the equality. Prince was always um, praising the, the city's schools for the music programs that they had. And, um, but he obviously saw the oppression that, that existed throughout the Twin Cities. Um, Prince's grandparents, all four of them were from this portion of um, Louisiana, these parishes. Um, and like I mentioned, they all moved to Minnesota in the 1930s. Um, here we see Prince's parents, his dad, John Nelson, who had a trio called the Prince Rogers Trio. Um, he was uh, employed at Honeywell during the day and then worked at night um, in burlesque clubs and black bars um, and strip clubs because, again, there was limitations as to where black artists could play. Um, his mother was 17 years junior of, of John. Um, she, she was a twin, um, Maddie and Edna May. And uh, she sang with the Prince Rogers Trio in the style of Billie Holiday. Um, Prince has a beautiful, partially completed autobiography where he really talks a lot about his parents. And I encourage you to read that. And he really talks about how he, you know, like we all do, I guess, take from different parts of our, our parents and their background. Um, Prince's parents met uh, during a performance at the Phyllis we, we, uh, Wheatley House Community Center uh, Settlement House. This was a really important institution for African Americans, again, moving up from the South. This was a place where they could stay until they found a job or housing. Um, critically important social institute. It was demolished by the building of the interstate system. But this is where um, his parents first met during, during a performance. Um, they married and uh, not, John had been previously married and had children. Um, Maddie had one son from a, a previous marriage, but their first son, 
first child together, Prince Rogers Nelson was born at Mount Sinai Hospital on June 7th, 1958. Uh, John said he named him Prince because he wanted his son to have everything he did not, but also threw in the name Roger so that his son had his stage name, which is kind of interesting. But there's also an important connection here. The Mount, um, you see the Mount Sinai Hospital on the right there and then today in its current configuration. Um, in the same way that African-Americans were experiencing segregation, um, Jewish doctors were unable to get hired by most hospitals. So a number of Jewish doctors uh, came together to, to find uh, the Mount Sinai Hospital. And a lot of white run hospitals wouldn't service African-American clients. So a number of them would, would go to Mount Sinai for medical care. Um, the hospital or the, the building today is actually being used for um, opioid addiction recovery, which is, you know, considering Prince's accidental fentanyl overdose. Um, I don't know what the right word is for it, but it is sort of an interesting connection. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Prince's childhood again. There are so many other properties and places I wish I could could hit on, but there just isn't time today. Um, I'm going to have John put a, a link to a report that I did. So if anyone wants to really dive deeper into some of these places, they can. Um, Prince was, um, when he was very little, they lived like for the first six months of his life in this apartment in sort of the center of Minneapolis, kind of between the north and the south sides. But shortly thereafter, the, the Nelsons bought uh, this home at 915 Logan Avenue. It has actually been demolished. Um, so what, what is there today is not the house where, where Prince lived for the first six years of his life. He does talk about being here when he was a child. He said it was the house was pink and it looked like Mad Men and everyone was you know very stylish, um, like the Kennedys, but black. Um, and that you know there was this black bourgeois Midwest style right after Ellington, not Ellington, but the time after him. And, you know, this this image of this this very um, polished uh, couple. But then he also talks a lot about his mother um, sort of always winking and communicating with him through her eyes. And that's one of his first memories, as well as his father playing the piano. Um, and he said it was a joyous sound and that it was at this house that he really developed the eyes and the ears of a songwriter, which he said can never get enough praise. The ways things look and the way things sounds um, can give a song space and gravity. So it's unfortunate that that house is no longer there. But by the time, just before Prince turned seven, uh, the Nelsons kept ownership of this house, but they purchased a new house just down Minneapolis's Alphabet Streets um, at uh, 2620 8th Avenue North. So this is between Thomas and Upton. So we see a picture of the house when they first purchased it on the left. Um, this was the place really where it all happened musically for Prince. Obviously, his previous house, he starts hearing the sounds of his parents singing and playing the piano. But it was here where he really mastered the piano. He was self-taught. He would watch his dad, and then he would talk about going out and buying records, and then he would recopy the lyrics, he, never the music. He says he never learned to read music. He would have the lyrics in front of him at the piano. He'd play the record behind him, and he would figure out the chords. And then um, he really learned to play along and sing along. and. He'd listen to James Brown, Ray Charles, Smokey Robinson, Aretha Franklin. He didn't care who it was, but he talked about those great singers that are funky and that how a word is shaped in the mouth and the velocity or subtlety with which it is said. But that's that's what makes a funky singer or not. And he certainly seems to have mastered that. Excuse me. Um, so this house really represents the place where Prince was not really a normal kid. He was focused on mastering the piano, mastering song craft, and really getting to understand that. Um, he lived here until about age 12. And his parents did divorce. There was a very messy divorce. Um, 
claims of, of physical abuse. And um, his father eventually moved out, but then his mother remarried and he and the stepdad did not really get along. So by the time, right before Prince turned 12, he moves out of, out of this house to go live with his dad. Now, when I was doing my research, this was really the most challenging period to figure out. Um, the house you see on the right, the Newton Avenue house, that's what many people said was Prince's childhood home where he lived when he was age seven and wrote his first song. Well, um, as a historian, excuse me, pulling the property deeds, I knew that his dad didn't move into the house until December of 1972, at which time Prince was 14 and a half years old. So I thought, well, maybe they rented the house prior to that, but city directories and other resources say, no, this, you know, he grew up in that yellow house. Um, that was his real childhood home. But what we see here are places he kind of bounced back and forth as a teenager. Some articles talk about Prince as being abandoned by his family and unloved and unwanted. But through some of the research I've done, the interviews, and then when Prince's partial autobiography came out in 2019, what we actually see is that Prince was, yes, there were some challenges with his stepdad and his father. But he was really, again, strategic and thoughtful about what he wanted to do. He wanted to be with his dad because his dad was a great musician. He also moved into his dad's sister's house, Aunt Olivia's house, when he was about 12 years old. And the reason for that was he wanted to attend Bryant Junior High School on the city's south side. Many articles will say that he was bused due to desegregation efforts. The timelines don't line up for that. There was not really desegregation going on at that time. And Bryant was a predominantly African-American school anyway. So it didn't seem to make sense that he was going there because of city desegregation efforts. He was going, sorry, listen to my voice. Um, hang on one second. Um, he was going there because it had a good music program. There was a class on the business of music and that's what he wanted to partake in. So um, he also lived for a time with his dad. He would maybe bounce back and forth between Aunt Olivia's house on, on the south side and his dad's house on the north side. The one thing we know is that it's during this period where he gets guitar and he really masters the guitar. So while we can tie the piano learning to the Yellow House on 8th Avenue. The guitar playing seems to have really developed during his, you know, years of moving around. So we also have one other teenage residence that um, where he lived. There's actually been some controversy about me saying that he lived here uh, for only about a year, year and a half. The uh, family, I am sorry about this. Um, the family is the family of his best friend at the time, Andre Simone, who is a bass player who plays with Prince. Um, they claim that Prince moved in with them when he was 13. And, you know, again, just through the research that I've done, I always tried to get two sources to sort of verify um, the timelines. It was through that that, you know, and even a quote from Prince at the time where he said he moves into this house when he's 16, just about ready to turn 17. I still think that the important story about this is, again, there was another household that was willing to take him in. He had great respect and love for Bernadette um, Anderson, who was his friend Andre's mother. She supported him. She helped encourage his musical interests. He found a lot of love and support and comfort in this house. So to me, it's not so much about how long it was there. It was more the impact that having this other house open to him had on him uh, that I think is really important. Um, the other thing I want to mention that was really formative in Prince's development was community center called The Way. Um, in a scene that is still playing out today here in the Twin Cities, um, in the late 60s, there were protests and riots over police treatment of Black people about you know, lack of economic opportunity for a lot of African-American residents. 
and it all sort of boiled over um, in the summers of 66 and 67. Here we see on the um, on the left, the National Guard were called out to North Minneapolis to try to control the rioting. And after that, there was some talk by city leaders um, as to what could be done and arguably very little change systematically as we see yet today, that there hasn't been real systematic change. But one thing that did come out of it was the creation of what was called the way. And this was a community led center for kind of filling that that need of like what the Phyllis Wheatley House did, you know, it's a gathering place, a place for people to have resources if they needed job information or training. And it was also a safe place for the kids to go and hang out. And they had a house band called The Family. And if you know your Prince side projects, he later had a side band called The Family, which seems to be an uh, honor to the family that played here. Um, Sonny Thompson was the leader of that, probably one of the best musicians to come out of Minnesota. And um, this was really a key place for um, Prince and other artists, uh, uh, Terry Lewis, um, Jimmy Jam, to sort of learn the craft and, and, and have that background. Um, unfortunately, like with many properties in this area, the way did not last very long. And built in its place was the Minneapolis 4th Police Precinct. Uh, one observer commented that's not um, just symbolic, that's erasure. So there's still, you know, a lot of um, tensions um, around, you know, the police being placed in this area of, of such an important community center. Um, by this time, when Prince was, you know, late teen, he was sort of an official musician. Here we see him listed, along with some of his other bandmates. If you remember Andre Simone, bass player, his sister Linda, Morris Day, who, you know, Morris Day in the time was in Purple Rain. Um, so, you know, by the time he's 17 years old, Prince is a um, local musician. He had a band. Uh, that was called Grand Central. It started over here. You can see Prince with his cousin Chaz, who was the original leader. Eventually he got kicked out and uh, we see the lineup of the Grand Central band here in the center with Morris Day and Andre Simone. And here's Prince. Here they are playing at a fashion show. They played battles of the bands. They played high school proms, all this stuff. But they were frustrated because they weren't making it and getting any sort of deal. But it's also at this time that um, Prince appears on some of the first recordings that we, we know of. This is the Cook House studio on Nicollet Avenue. It had a lot of different names throughout its history. The song Surf and Bird was recorded here, Your Welcome Word World, um, and um, other, other hits. But um, Prince performed with the band 94 East, and he played rhythm guitar and did some vocals. If you haven't heard 94 East, I encourage you to, to listen. You can hear some early Prince, which is really exciting. Um, it was also at this time that Prince, Andre Simone, and Morris Day went to cut some demo tapes. And they, they went to Moonsound Studios. Now, Moonsound Studios, there were three locations. The one in the, 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 the second one was the one where Prince first started working. And nobody seemed to know where it was. Um, I, I read an interview with Chris Moon where he said that at one point, um, Morris and Andre took a break and went across the street to the Baskin Robbins 31 Flavors to get some ice cream, but Prince hung out. And he heard Prince playing all the instruments, doing all the work himself. And Chris Moon was looking for an artist to cover the songs that he wrote. He didn't want to be a star, he just wanted to write songs. So he thought, if I'm only working with one kid, I don't have to worry about the drummer not showing up or the guitar player being drunk. So he asked Prince, do you want to learn how to record and, and do all this recording um, art? And so Prince apparently just nodded his head. He was very shy and quiet. And the two of them started working together, but I couldn't figure out where this property was located, but I did end up pulling the um, city directories found where there was a Baskin Robbins. And then I went out there and like took pictures of all the commercial buildings around it. And I sent them to Chris Moon and asked him which one it was. And he gave me the thumbs up that it was this property. So that was a fun little detective 
piece. Um, Prince was not, he cut some demo tapes there with Chris Moon. He Nothing came of it. He got very frustrated. So he did some recording here at Sound 80 Studio. This was the premier recording studio in the Twin Cities. Dylan recorded here. The song Funky Town was recorded here. So Prince cut his demo tapes here, along with doing some other band work. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Um, and it was based on those demo tapes that his manager, Owen Husney, was able to sell him to record companies out in LA. They eventually landed with Warner Brothers, and he got um, a very lucrative contract for a three record deal. Um, he actually did go back to Sound 80 to start recording, but um, in the end, ended up going out to California to the record plant in Salsalito to do his debut album, For You. He did some other albums, but on all those albums, he was doing everything, playing all the instruments, all the engineering, everything. So when it came time to do a live performance, he didn't have a band, so he and, and the Warner Brothers wanted him to take all these seasoned LA artists, nothing against LA artists, but Prince wanted to stay connected to his Minneapolis roots. So he pulled in band members that he had worked with here, who we see on the side. And for their sort of test run concert, they actually performed at the Capri Theater, which was actually sort of an adult movie club, but it was in Prince's hometown neighborhood. And he wanted to give back to the community and the gentleman who ran it was having financial difficulties. So for $4, could have gotten a ticket to see Prince. Things didn't go well. They needed a little more time to get their act together, you know, to, to do the touring. But um, this is, you know, one of the key performance places where Prince first um, performed when he became a, a recording artist. Again, because due to time, I'm, I'm having to cut out a few properties in this step, but I did, um, in his evolution, but I did want to highlight the by the time he got to his third album he had spent most of his money under his contract and he had to get a third album out quickly um so he was living in a house on the shores of lake minnetonka and he just had sort of a beat up old guitar and he did what he thought was demo tapes um, but it turned out to be what was considered probably the first album to truly incorporate all the elements of the minneapolis sound it was his album dirty mind it was really his um, you know, he said he wasn't being deliberately prov provocative, he was being deliberately him. It's full of really graphic lyrics, much more edgy, much more of that new wave element incorporated into it. But again, I couldn't figure out where this house was. So I actually was able to, through the city records, track down a sewer inspection report that had been requested by Prince Nelson, who was the renter. So that was great to be able to find it. Unfortunately, the house that is there, after Prince moved out, the house he was living in burned down. So this is not the house where he lived. Now, between here, um, after here, Prince lived in two other places. They both had been demolished by Prince, one after his father passed away and had been living in the house, he demolished it. And then another after, he divorced his first wife and they lost their child, he demolished it. So in, in all these cases, Prince lived and record, recorded in the places he lived. And so between this house and those other two houses, we've lost the recording studios basically where so many critical Prince songs from the early 80s were recorded. But jumping ahead, we do get to Paisley Park. Um, now, my research really didn't spend as much time on Paisley Park. I'm kind of like one of those people when you read a biography and the person makes it like I lose interest. I kind of felt like, you know, we know what happens once he gets to Paisley Park. We know where he is. We know what he's up to. It was really that journey from the north side to Paisley Park that intrigued me. But of course, Paisley Park is critical um, in the story of Prince in Minnesota. Um, the story goes that he wanted to, to work with Matt. Uh, it, I believe it's pronounced Thony, Thony. Um, and he really wanted to create um, a place that he could rehearse, make movies, make videos, record, um, do performances. He wanted it to be a place of happiness and gathering. Some people have said it kind of looks like an Ikea or a car dealership, but um, 
you know, it's right next to the highway when you drive past it and it's lit up in purple, it's very stunning. So here we see the exterior, this was built in 1987. And like I said, it, it contained residents and studios. Um, so there were, there were four studios there so he could record any time of day or night, which he usually did at night. He'll notice not a lot of windows on, on the building because he apparently didn't want to get interrupted with his sort of circadian rhythm. Um, just a few other pictures showing the interior, which if you go to tour it today, you can get access to that main floor, but not the upstairs. And like I said, this was a performance place too, where he would perform um, kind of, you, you had to know who to know to get information on when he would be performing and he may or may not start at sort of a normal time. Sometimes people would wait till 3 a.m. To, to hear him start performing. So, and like I said, I'm sorry, I'm really having to rush through it. I, through my research, that again, started with trying to figure out if that one childhood house was historic, resulted in identifying over 50 places associated with Prince. And I'm not saying that that's everything, but these seem to be sort of the major spots. He also seemed to not really like St. Paul because St. Paul is over to the right there. He was mainly in Minneapolis. But I was now faced with, you know, having found all these properties, um, having the one childhood home to look at and trying to figure out what what is what are the significant places here and how does this work within the National Register of Historic Places? I mean, obviously Paisley Park is going to be a given. It represents the culmination of his success. He was associated with it for almost 30 years up until the time of his passing. This is the time period when he was really fighting for the artistic freedom from his recording contracts. You know, uh, early use of the internet really paved the way, changed the, the music business side of it. But this was also an era where he had less commercial success. And I'm not saying we should always judge our artists by commercial success, but all of his, almost all of his number one hits and most popular albums were recorded you know, prior to the building of Paisley Park. So I also was, and, and a, there was a lot of talk about you know, Paisley Park will be considered historic. There was a petition to start a National Historic Landmark campaign. But I found myself within what I like to call the, the Highlander versus the triple dilemma. So on the one hand, we could just take the Highlander approach and say there can be only one. It's Paisley Park. That's, you know, we, we check all the boxes for Criterion B. So that should be just fine. Or we could go the, the trouble with Tribbles route where like every place he ever slept, recorded, performed would be considered significant. But of course that then just devalues the, the, the more meaningful places. Um, so I didn't really know what to do and how to evaluate it. So my good friend, uh, Barbara Howard, Barbara Mitchell Howard suggested that um, I write a MPDF, which I had never done before. And as far as I know, there's not a lot of them that have been done on an individual. So it was interesting. Um, took me a couple of years. And I did only go up to the building of Paisley Park, because again, that sort of writes its own story. But knowing how to deal with performance venues and childhood homes and all that was, was really complicated. And this is where I want those of us in this industry to really think about why is Criterion B so hard? Um, we have how many commercial districts on the National Register because we can always argue there's a local significance. We have hundreds and hundreds of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings on the National Register because it's Frank Lloyd Wright. It's clear to me that our, um, what was established 50 years ago or so with the National Register was focused on certain property types. And that like Criterion B was sort of, you know, for significant individuals was, there were a lot of barriers put in the way. It's like childhood home, but only if they're productive or there's nothing else left. Um, a community may have several properties for association with the same important person. 
but you can only have them if it represents a different aspect of their productive life. Why? Um, length of association is important, but can be, you know, brief if it's consequential, which is, I think, a good thing. But I just found it so frustrating to think that if we had Paisley, that these other things were going to be really hard to make a case for. But I, I did, and I tried. And the basic argument I made was that if all that exists of Prince in 100 years is Paisley Park, he's not going to make any sense. He's not going to, the context of the Minneapolis sound and that, you know, going from the north side to Paisley Park is going to be lost. Um, so to date, we have two places that are historic for association with Prince. The estate, dealing with Prince's um, estate, has meant that nobody's willing to really try that much with Paisley Park because they're just in such a mess right now. The lawyers don't want to talk about National Register eligibility. But I made a case for Sound 80 and for the childhood home where he mastered the piano and songwriting. Um, the childhood home is now considered eligible. Sound 80 is listed on the National Register. I know we are almost out of time. I was going to ask a quick quiz of which studio in Minneapolis, in Minnesota do you think um, has had the most number one hits? And there are two here that we haven't talked about, so I know that's a little bit unfair to you. Um, here we've got the Paisley Park, which you know we've talked about Sound 80, which I mentioned um, that you know Dylan and Funky Town, and there was actually a lot of advancement and digital recording happened here. Prince recorded here. We've got the Pachyderm Studios, which a lot of sort of more grunge alternative artists like um, Soul Asylum, um, Nirvana, Babes in Twilight I'm recorded that. And then the Flight Time Studios, which was Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. So if, if you guys want to just sort of make your guess, and I will try and wrap this up very quickly. So I don't know how much time we'll need for closing that out. Sound 80, Paisley. Awesome. Well, um, the actual correct answer is, and like, it's my slide, flight time. Um, the studio has had more hits than any other recording studio. Uh, Janet Jackson, Mary J. Blige, um, Luther Vandross. There's also a real strong focus on um, local African American artists recording here, Sounds of Blackness. It, it is incredible the scope of um, artists who performed here and the, the accomplishments of Jam and Lewis at this building. But I did want to emphasize again why Criterion B is an issue and why the 50 year rule, it's not a rule, guidance is an issue. Because this property was evaluated, I tried to make a case that it was historic, but it was determined to not be. The reasons were because it was less than 50 years old. Now we all know you can argue exceptional significance, but in this case, the feeling was it was too close, it was too far away from 50 to really make it. And, and there was a comment that it's not that it wasn't historically important, it just doesn't meet National Register criteria. And also because Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are still living, we couldn't, um, and again, you can kind of work your way around that, but it's really darn hard. And so I just question like, if you can write a context and you can tell that something is important, even if somebody is alive, what are we afraid of that they're going to do more historic stuff? We should be celebrating that, not punishing people for it. Again, they, the list of awards of what came out of the studio and what Jam and Lewis did is just astonishing. And this is its fate. It was recently demolished. And now we have very few properties associated with, with the, their connection. Same with Prince, over 60% of the properties I have researched have been demolished. But this is why we need to identify and preserve these places because these places matter. I've taken over 1500 people on tours myself to see these places. We need to identify them. We need to not have so many restrictions because otherwise we will lose places and not have the diversity and inclusion we need. Um, we're at the beginning of a burgeoning music heritage industry here, but we're losing our resources too quickly. So sorry, I went a little bit over what I was supposed to do, but thank you all for a very funky time and I am happy to take any questions.
Thank you, Kristen. I am going to hand this over to Gretchen and John. I'm going to be on the back end doing some of the chat. Great. Thanks so much, Kristen. That was great. Um, there was one request if we could see the family photos again. So maybe you can go back to those while we see sure. up questions for you. Sure. Sorry, I should have. Oh, it's okay. They were towards the beginning. So yeah, here is um, um, sorry. So this is Prince with his dad. And here he is, little thumb sucker. Um, his his cousin Chaz, who's in the band with him. This is actually his aunt Edna, so his mother's twin, and their father Frank Shaw. Um, there was this one again. Maternal grandma, his mom, and his aunt, and his dad. That was it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll jump into some content questions here because there's some really good ones about sort of the significance issue. Um, so Stephanie Reich asked, you mentioned Prince lived in the house at 915 Logan until he was six. While he had influence and memories of that time, his primary work had not been done when he was living there. Additionally, at 2628th Street, although he was training as a music musician, the work he is well for, known for was not done when he was living in that house. So she's interested in understanding how would you look at those two houses from his earlier kind of childhood? Would you find them eligible? Well, yeah, and like I mentioned at the end, the, the yellow house here is eligible for the National Register. So we argued that Prince wasn't just a normal child, that he was being productive here. Cause again, you know, I had to work within that system and so I use the argument of productivity that we have a lot of documentation from Prince himself and others that, that he just mastered the piano while living here, that this is the place that we can most closely tie that to. So while it's not associated with recordings, you know, there's other places, um, I think it's TC Steel, and of course I'm gonna draw a blank now on the other ones where, where people mastered their their craft that have been recognized as eligible for the National Register because of that product productivity angle. So that one is on the national or less eligible for the National Register. So the it's really is, representing like this early phase of his career, whereas Paisley Park is this like later phase where he's more established, but they both can be eligible. Right. Because again, Criterion B says if they represent different phases of a person's career. So this house we did not make a case for because it's been demolished and rebuilt. So we have no integrity for the Logan house. But this house we did, yes, because it represents that other aspect of his career. Great. Um, another question. This was from Facebook from Marisha. She asked, how involved, at, if at all, was Prince in the construction and design of Paisley Park? Was he the owner builder, like was he actually involved in the design that you know of? Yes, Prince was extensively involved in the design. Um, you know, uh, is it Th Thaney, am I saying that right? The architect um, who's, who's from Venice, California. Yeah, Prince was very, very much involved. He wanted that sort of white neutral exterior so he could wash it with purple. He was really into the, the, the the pyramids that were on top and wanted that sort of, again, he would light that up if he was performing. Um, so he was uh, very much involved. Um, Matt saying he doesn't, he's done some interviews, but he doesn't like to really give out a whole lot. I've actually asked him if he could donate the plans or any you know building notes to the Minnesota Historical Society for researchers to understand it more. Most of what we have right now is sort of just anecdotal, like, you know, Prince would go to him and say, I want, you know, this and this, and then he would design it and approve it. Thank you. Um, we had a question just asking if there was any connection between Prince and Bob Dylan, also from Minnesota. Um, let's see. Yes, there is one connection. So, and this is one of the things I had to leave out. So when Prince was doing one of his early tours for his second album, Named Prince. He performed at the Orpheum Theater, which at the time was owned by Bob Dylan and his brother. Um, 
I don't have any confirmation that they ever met or that they ever collaborated on anything, but there is that that one sort of place connection that they they both share. Hmm. I wasn't sure you'd be able to answer that. You totally could answer that. <laughs> Good job. Um, a couple of questions here about flight time. So one question from Stephanie was, is the association with for flight time with the people or the use? And in your opinion, is there a difference? Um, I, I made the argument for both. I said um, that it does represent, that I, I made the case that Jam and Lewis were exceptionally significant because of the work that they did, not only sort of charting, but also this collaborating with local African-American artists to give them a platform, um, sort of giving back to the community, um, but also that the studio as a place, um, you know, Criterion A, just broad patterns of association with that sort of record of all those hits. And again, the, the, the con and, and I, I'm not just saying this to throw our shippo under the bus, I, I'm good friends with our shippo. I think they felt their hands were tied that it was like it, it, it's so challenging to prove criterion B or exceptional significance. And I think we just have to accept if we're going to keep those same restrictions, we are going to lose a lot of these properties before they get a chance to be like of historic age. Hmm. Um, another question about flight time was just was there any public opposition to the demolition at the time? Yeah, it um, it was a challenge because there wasn't really public outreach under the 106 process. I I knew that it was advertised that it was coming down, but I did not. Most people didn't know that there was like a section 106 component. I found out very late in the game and tried to deal with it in the 11th hour, and it didn't work well. I um, there was a petition with I think close to 800 people who signed it asking for its preservation but and, and here's the kicker it was being torn down to build much needed public housing and you know so if you opposed the demolition then you know people thought you're opposing public housing which i wasn't I'm like we can have both we can have preservation and public housing does the public housing have to go here but it was really too late in the process um petra asked if you could give some more info on the longer lectures that you do on Prince, I know you've done walking tours in the past before COVID, but kind of what's your, if people want to learn more, how can they yep. find that? Yep. So um, I don't know if John, if you were able to put the link to the multiple property document form that I did. So that's, you know, if you want to read yep. something um, right now, look for the Preserve Minneapolis website. Um, this year, we're going to just be doing another online tour. Um, because of COVID, we don't want to um, still be meeting in person. But in the future, hopefully, we will also do in-person tours. And also, just because you could probably tell I love talking about music history and prints and everything. I mean, if you're in town, look me up. I just, I've sometimes just taken people I've never met, just like, hey, let's go look at some places. Um, so so those are just a couple ways you can um, learn more. There's um, it's also a, a website called Purple Places through Augsburg College that I helped to develop with sort of some of these places and a little bit of a write-up. Um, another question here, Stephanie, I had a follow-up question about asking about those early childhood homes. She was wondering, um, she said she understands your approach and questioning of the National Register criteria. She says, I also understand that many believe that designation aids monetary value to a property. However, this is a controversial issue. Do you have trepidation on designating properties owned by Black Americans with the full understanding that many regulations placed on properties historically have prevented wealth building for African Americans? Um, well, that's a, that's a really good question. I guess I hadn't specifically thought of it and I, I appreciate that question. I, I would say that because of the, the way the system works that, that it can't be, um, listed without you know the property owner's um, approval um, the idea that something is eligible for the national register often doesn't extend beyond those of us in the 106 world you know we're just assessing effects from a transit line going nearby it so i i don't know how that could affect um property values but i would i would think that it would be less of an issue 
if it's just eligible for local designation we have heard from people especially in the north side andre simone's house and other places that there is great concern that local designation would require them to do certain repairs that could be cost prohibitive so yeah we we do have to be sensitive to that all right, I'm gonna jump on in. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. You did a wonderful job with the Q and A. I'm so excited to have you as our guest co-host. And John seemed very quiet over there, so I think he appreciated. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm happy to. I'm happy to ask another question, but uh, I know, but we need to wrap it up because I have actually, a couple of uh, announcements. One thing before we wrap it up. Yeah, one one thing before we wrap it up. There was a lot of mention of uh, how, what a shame it was that flight time was demolished, and they were wondering. Um, if there was any community opposition or any sort of pushback on that. Well, like I said, it was it was so late in the 106 process that by the time I brought it up, yes, there there was um, a petition that over 800 people signed saying, please don't tear it down. But again, the the proposed project to go in that spot was public housing, which everybody was like, we know this is needed. So it it was just an awful scenario of timing. I wish I had jumped on it sooner because then maybe the conversation could have been different than at the 11th hour, which is often the case with preservation. That's why we need to identify the places and have more flexibility to say things are historic so that we can preserve them. Yeah, and, and on that note, um, there were some people that were wondering about the record plant in uh, Sausalito, which um, I posted in the answer a link to uh, the latest news about it, which means uh, it looks like it it may be undergoing renovation and will be used again as Ken, a record recording. Ken Calais, who, who produced the Fleetwood Mac rumors and other albums, well, rumors at that record plant, has purchased it and is going to reopen it as a museum and recording studio. And I would love to work with him on that project. So if he's listening, call me. <laughs> I also love Fleetwood Mac. And I saw somebody ask a question. Yes, I loved Prince before this. This was my way of processing my morning. I didn't know what I could do after Prince died. And it, like many people, we just felt sort of rudderless, but I'm like, I can research things and I can make arguments for eligibility. And that's that's what I did to sort of channel that grief. Thank you, uh, Kristen. I'm, uh, John, if you wouldn't mind posting in the chat, I was just gonna do it, but I'm gonna talk instead. A link to our conference registration, uh, which just opened uh, this week. And the conference is scheduled for June 8th through 10th. And it's a uh, radical conservation preservation from the left coast. And uh, Kristen, this has been such a great uh, presentation. And um, when we were talking before, I'd mentioned a lot of us have issues with the 50 year guideline. And when while you were talking, I posted a PDF uh, written by John Sprinkle Jr. about the origins of the 50 year uh, oh. guideline, which is a really good, I can send it to you if you haven't seen it yet, but it's a really good comprehensive, we did a lot of research about it. How did this thing start? You know, and how can we kind of um, get around some of it? Uh, uh, as many people mentioned in the chat, it's often used as a uh, more of a block than a help yep. uh, to uh, getting things on the National Register recognized and protected. Uh, so I wanted to also mention that we have two more in this series, this series of 1970s uh, uh, saving the recent recent past is sponsored by US modernist radio. Uh, hey, George, he's out there somewhere. And also, this is done in partnership with the Cultural Landscape Foundation. And our next one, uh, we have two more coming up in this series. The next one is on next Tuesday. John, what is the title of this one that's coming up on Tuesday? You're muted. <laughs> it's like Pomo something. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, pom pomos and popos. So I see that's why I couldn't figure it out. Pomos and popos. And this is a virtual tour, right? It is a virtual tour of the Embarcadero Center. Uh, so we'll look at Portman. We'll sort of walk down. We'll talk a little bit about Halprin. We'll have a panel, which may include Gretchen or may include one of her colleagues. Um, and as well as Charles Birnbaum from the TCLF. Um, and uh, it'll be a fun time. So we'll be done in an hour and it'll be a short 20 minute virtual tour. 
Well, who wouldn't want to miss a little bit of Portman and Halprin together? <laughs> so that's going to be next Tuesday at noon. It is free, and you can register on our website as usual. And then the last one in this series is featuring uh, Charles Birnbaum of the Cultural Landscape Foundation talking about preserving urban plazas, which is something he's been working on for a long time. We've provided links to TCLF on our website and also U.S. Modernist Radio. Uh, Kristen, thank you again so much for for uh, coming on today. We had so many compliments. Uh, I want to ask you real quick is where can people get in touch with you? Well, thank you for this opportunity. We did um, just put my work email, my personal oh, okay. email, my phone num number in the chat. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.